Welcome to our discussion on exponential growth and decay. We're going to see uh, some different applications of this idea. I want you to remember that it always comes back to this formula. All forms of exponential growth and decay can be modeled or represented by this simple function that P stands for population, right? So it can be population of bacteria, it can be population of people, wolves, it can even be money if you can think of it as a population of like dollars and cents. But anyways, your your population, your amount at some time t is going to be equal to the initial, right? P sub zero always means initial. The initial population times e to some constant k times t. And um, we'll see that there are many examples of this in the natural world. Uh, nuclear physics, when we talk about radioactive uh, decay, uh, they have rates that are proportional to the mass. Uh, in chemistry there are examples. In, in finance the most uh, common example is continuously compounded interest. So this is an important concept. Okay, so in general, if we have some function, some y function, right, y of t, and it's the value of some quantity y at some time t, duh, that's what a y function is, right, gives us the quantity at a time t, and if the rate of change of y with respect to t is proportional to its size at any given time, then that means the derivative of the function, right, which is the rate of change of that function, is equal to the actual value of the function times a constant. And this is just um, a calculus example of variation that you should have seen in a standard pre-calc or algebra class, right? You say like, um, w varies directly as v and you know that you have this relationship where w equals some constant times v well now we're just saying the rate of change of the function right that's my w varies directly with respect to the function itself that's my v okay so it's the same idea as variation in this case direct variation now this equation is sometimes uh, referred to as the law of natural growth when k is greater than zero the law of natural de decay if k is less than zero who really cares right it's all just talking about uh, direct variation um, it's called a differential equation because it's an equation that also happens to have a derivative in it so these are all the different names that you're going to hear uh, spouted off talking about this don't get bogged down in the jargon. Just realize that we're just talking about some simple direct variation and then we're going to go from there. Okay, well, it's not too hard to uh, think about this and ask yourself, well, if a derivative is equal to a constant times the function, well, the only function I know of that is its own derivative is the e function, right? We know that uh, d dx of e to the x just equals e to the x. We also know that uh, d dx of e to let's say the 3x equals e to the 3x times the derivative of 3x right by the chain rule and we get that the derivative of this function is a constant times itself. Do you see how this is now my k? And then we also know that if we take a derivative, let's say, of a 7e to the 5x, this is going to equal 35e to the 5x, right? Because the 7 just goes along for the ride, right? This ends up being 7e to the 5x times the derivative of 5x, which is the 5, and that's where we get the 35e to the 5x. And so we can generalize that and go, well, if we have any function of this form, c e to the kt, where c is a constant, then we know when we take the derivative of it, the c just kind of goes along for the ride, and it's just the derivative of e to the kt. And the k comes down, and we get c times k, right? Well, by the commutivity of multiplication, we can pull that k out here instead and say k times c. And this c e to the ky is my original function, right? my original yt. So I just get that the derivative equals k times the original function. And ta-da, there is an example of 
the derivative of my function with respect to t equaling some constant k times the original function. Okay, we're going to go through some more examples, but you're going to see that any function that satisfies this property of dy dt equaling ky is going to have to be of the general form y equals ce to the kt. And then we also can notice the significance of this letter c, this constant, because when you let t equal 0 at time 0, then k times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, and you get the function just equals c. And c ends up being the initial value of that function. So we can generalize this formula even more, and instead of just calling this some arbitrary c, we can now say that it is, in fact, the initial value of our function. And this is now going to be the general function, right? the general equation of anything that is going to model exponential growth and decay. You're going to see examples of this where the, the uh, formulas look slightly different, but it's just a modification of this formula. Okay, so get to learn this. It's going to help you out of a lot of jams in uh, physics, chemistry, biology, and then, of course, throughout calculus and other math classes. Okay, what is the significance of the k, right? We already talked about c is the initial uh, value. What about that constant k? Well, in the context of a population growth, where pt is going to be the size of your population at some time t, so instead of calling this a y function, we're now going to call it a, a t function, right? So instead of, instead of y of t equals y0 e to the kt, we can talk about this as a population uh, function. So P, y just makes it seem like kind of a generic function. P is just telling us that more precisely this function is going to model a population of something. Well, if that's the case, instead of taking the derivative of y with respect to t, we're just taking the derivative of p with respect to t, right? And instead of y being our function, it's this p function. So that's all that we're doing here is we're talking about a p function instead of a y function. Same thing, gave it a different letter. We can see algebraically speaking, we can divide both sides by this p function, right? And we've solved for k. This constant k is now 1 over p times the rate of change of the function. And this quantity, this, this k piece, is in fact the growth rate divided by the population size, right? Because this is the growth rate, the rate of change of the function. How fast it's changing, that's its growth rate and then divided by the population size. Well, that is what's called a relative change. Whenever you talk about how fast something is changing with respect to its size, it's no longer just a straight growth rate. It's now a relative growth rate. So this is just saying how fast is the function changing divided by the, the size of the function you know, at that particular point. That gives us a relative growth rate for that function, and so therefore k is just the relative growth rate of our function. Now according to our equation of what k is, instead of saying that the growth rate is proportional to population size, which is what this is saying, right? This phrase here, the growth rate is proportional to population size, is this. Growth rate, dp dt, is proportional, right, a uh, constant times population size p. Instead of that, when we do the algebra and we turn it into the green equation, we can now say that the relative growth rate is constant because this piece here on the left, right, this whole chunk right here, remember, is relative growth rate because by definition it's growth rate divided by the thing. That's a relative growth rate. The relative growth rate equals k. We know k is a constant, so the relative growth rate is constant. We get those two pieces of information just from one equation. And then now, using this number two theorem that we've seen, this says that the population with a constant relative growth rate must grow exponentially, right? Because if it has a k right there, which we now know is a constant relative growth rate, then we know that that population, that population, 
y function, the population, is going to grow exponentially because it has this e function. Notice that the relative growth rate k appears as the coefficient of t in this exponential function. That's how we know that this is the case. So all this gobbledygook is just saying is that we know anything that grows exponentially is going to be modeled by this simple generic function um, in theorem 2. So anything that has exponential growth and decay will be modeled this way. This also says that a population with a constant relative growth rate will grow exponentially and will be modeled this way. So if you know a population has a constant relative growth rate, then you know it's growing exponentially. It just kind of relates those two concepts together. So for instance, let's say the growth rate, right, dpdt, of some population is equal to 0.02 times that population. Then if we divide both sides by p, we get that k is equal to 0.02, and the relative growth rate is 0.02, or 2%. Well, that just tells us that because that's the case, we now have a population that is growing exponentially and we can model it with this p of t equals p0, right, or p0, it's just the initial population, times e to the kt, where k is that 2%. It's going to help you when you're dealing with word problems and you need to come up with these equations from some English. Let's look at an example. We can use the fact that the world population was 2,560 million. Some people would call that 2.5 billion. Just so you know, not all uh, countries' populations consider 2,000 million to be a billion. So this is the more kind of widely um, accepted way of, of expressing this number. So you might think of that as 2.56 billion. Others will just call it 2,560 million in 1950. And then 3,040 million in 1960 to model the population of the world in the second half of the 20th century. We, of course, have to assume that the growth rate is proportional to the population size, meaning that it fits that model of dp dt is going to equal k times p, right, the population. We want to find what is that relative growth rate i.e. what is k when you take dpdt and divide it by p and then we want to use the model we want to use that k plug it back into our generic model of uh, pt right equals p sub zero e to the kt we want to plug it back into that and be able to estimate the world's population in 93 and predict it in 2020 so how do we do that well we start with what we know we're going to start with kind of setting the boundaries if we're going to kind of start the clock at 1950, then we're going to let the year 1950 equal when time equals zero, because that was our first data point. So we might as well let that be time equals zero. It's going to make the math a lot easier if we think about this as each year is just years since 1950. That way you don't have to plug 2020 into your uh, formula. You're only going to plug 70 into your formula because it's 70 years past 1950. Okay, we measure the population um, in millions of people. So again, instead of looking for an answer that's 2560 with a bunch of zeros after it, we can just say the population when time equals zero was 2560. And then we just know that that's in millions of people. And then uh, con similarly, the P of 10, the population, and remember P of 10 is what? It's, it's 10 years beyond, so that's the population in 1960. Go back up here. Remember they told us what it was in 1950 and then 1960, 10 years later, was 3040. Since we're assuming that it's constant, right, we can use these formulas. We know that from theorem 2 we have the generic formula of y of t equals y of 0, right, the initial value e to the kt here we're just calling them p's because we're dealing with populations. We plug in everything that we know. We know p of z p sub zero is 2560. That was the initial value. Then we also know p of 10 was equal to uh, 3040. So we plug those in, and we plug in the 10 for t. So now we have this formula here, right? Where this number is our p of 10. 
this is our t, this is our p of sub zero. So we basically just plugged in for this, plugged in for this, plugged in for that, and the only unknown left is k, and we can solve for k. So algebraically speaking, divide both sides by 2560, and you get e to the 10k equals 3040 over 2560. I would do that at a minimum. Then realize that we have to take the natural log of both sides to get rid of the e. So now you have 10k equals natural log of 304 over 256. Again, I would reduce this number just to make my life easier. And then, of course, divide both sides by 10 to solve for k, which is what they have written down here. And you get this approximate decimal. Now, if you're going to be doing um, some accurate scientific work, like we strive to do, you really don't want to round this decimal. You really want to leave k as this. You know, we've got calculators that can deal with those big numbers, so just leave it that way. I would reduce the 304 over 256, because that reduces very easily. You can see that it's divisible by 2. Uh, and in fact, I believe it's, they're both divisible by 4. And then you can maybe even reduce it further. But then I would just leave it this way. Or think of it as 1 tenth times natural log of that. But leave it this way so it's, a, it's, a, it's an accurate number rather than a decimal approximation. Because now we move on to the next part of the question, which is, um, you know, well, if we want to know what the relative growth rate is, we have to figure out the um, decimal approximation because we need to be able to say what that is as a percent. And we can see that's roughly 1.7%. That's where that comes from. That's fine. But if we want to then start using this formula to estimate things, we'll get a much more accurate answer if instead of having this decimal in that place, you instead have E raised to the right one tenth natural log of refresh my memory 304 over 256 304 over 256 and again reduce that and um, and this is more accurate than that you'll see that the uh, the solutions won't be too different but depending on how many decimal places you need to carry uh, this will help you uh, stay more accurate. Okay, so we can see that in 1993, remember where we were starting in uh, uh, t equals 0 was 1950. So if we're over here at 1993, that's a change of 43. So that's t equals 43, and that's how we plug 43 in here, which means we're plugging 43 in for t. And then very easily just slap that into a calculator, and we get this as our answer. We could also then go for 220, which is going to be 70, right? 70 years passed, but 70 in there, and we get that for an estimate. Um, right now, the world population in uh, 2014, last time I checked, I think was around 6 point something million. This is or 6 point something billion. This or close to 7. Can't remember. This is saying it's going to be 8.5 billion roughly in 2020. Okay, um, we can uh, check our model by graphing it and seeing how well it lines up with known data points. The blue dots on this uh, graph, and I apologize if you can't see them, they're, they're not real large. Uh, let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you. There you go. Now you can see those blue dots a little better. Those blue dots represent known data values where we've actually calculated um, populations since 1950. And then I believe the last dot on this um, here, right? If this is 20 to 40, then 60 would be out here, which would be 2010. So this is less than 2010. I believe that's the 1993 dot, and it lines up almost perfectly. So it's a pretty good model. It seems to model um, the known values really well. As we've stated in other classes and other uh, videos, anytime you want to predict outside of a certain uh, data range of your data values, it gets riskier. Uh, your model might fit your data values really well, but it might just fall to pieces when you go outside of that uh, range by a significant amount and try to then predict all the way up to 220. Tw sorry, 2020.
Okay, uh, another example would be radioactive decay. We know that radioactive substances decay by emitting radiation. If m of t is the mass remaining from an initial mass of m sub 0 of the substance after some time t, then we know the relative decay rate is basically going to be negative 1 over m dm dt. This just comes from the same idea right, of dy dt equaling k times y which gives you 1 over k dy dt equaling y. Well, all that's changing now is instead of a y function, it's an m function, right? And then uh, this 1 over m is the 1 over y. Sorry, I messed this up. This should be 1 over y, and this equals k. Right. I mean, the other one was accurate, but that's not what we care about. We care about what k is. So here's we're just doing a derivative of m instead of a derivative of y. And you might ask, well, how come it's a negative? Well, it's a negative, right? Because dm dt is negative. It's a it's a rate of decay. The relative rate is positive. It'll follow that this dm dt equals km, where k is now going to be this negative number. So the change in mass, right, we leave it as a, a positive rate. The mass itself is positive. So the k, this relative rate of decay, is going to be a negative constant. All right, so in other words, this, uh, radioactive substances we know are going to decay at a rate proportional to how much mass is left. This means we can use that standard function, that standard equation that we saw, we labeled number two. And we can write it this way. The mass at some time t is equal to the initial mass times e to the kt. And normally when physicists and other uh, scientists are using this, they refer to the rate of decay in terms of half-life. They basically want to know how long will it take for a substance to lose half of its mass. So they'll tell us that the half-life of a certain substance is 1,900, sorry, 1,590 years. And if we have a sample of that substance, in this case being radium-226, and we have a sample of it that has a mass of 100 milligrams, so we basically have 100 milligrams of this substance, we want to find a formula for the mass of the sample that remains after t years. We basically want to figure out what m of t is. We also want to find the mass after 1,000 years. And then we also want to figure out um, how long it will take, right? what will the, the number of years, what will t be, until the mass has been reduced to 30 milligrams. Now this seems like an arbitrary question. Why should we care how long it's going to take for our 100 milligrams of radium-226 to go down to 30 milligrams? Well, it's actually a very important question. Think of something like Chernobyl. You all know what Chernobyl is, right? Big nuclear meltdown, the entire area got dosed with radiation, and it's now uninhabitable. But that radiation does have a half-life, and we know that those levels of radiation are going down and down and down every single year. We also know what safe levels of radiation are. How low does radiation have to be until human beings can live in that area without developing cancers and leukemia and all sorts of problems? Well, we can set, we can, we know, we can measure what the radiation level is now. We know what the half-life of those radioactive isotopes are. We can set the goal of whatever the level needs to be, and then we can calculate how many years it will take to get there. And I think it takes thousands of years in the case of Chernobyl. But you get the idea that it is an important thing to know. It's actually at a level that's safe enough now that people can take short trips into Chernobyl, and they're actually doing, um, what would you call it? Uh, you can go and check it out. <laughs> they're, they're actually taking you on tours of Chernobyl now. Okay, let's start with part A. Let mt be the mass that remains after t years. So we know dm dt is going to equal km. We know that the initial amount is 100. So we plug all that stuff into our general formula. And we know that the mass of this substance is going to be the initial amount, which is 100 times e to the kt. Now, in order to solve for 100, we need 
some more information, right? We need, we've got basically three variables at this point. We don't know m of t. That's our output. That's like a y, right? We don't know the output of, of the function. We don't know the input, the t, and we don't know the constant. We have three uh, variables with this one equation. We can only solve for one unknown, so we need to plug in for two of them. Luckily, they gave us one more piece of information. They told us that 1590 was the half-life. Right? If time equals 1590, then this thing is going to be half of its known quantity. So if it started with 100, we know it's going to be half of that, or 50. So we plug in the t of right, a time of 1590. We have the 100 of the initial. We know that the output will be 50. And now all that's left is the k that we're trying to solve for. So very simply, we divide both sides by 100, and we get this, where e to this equals a half. Take the natural log of both sides, which gives us 1590k equals the natural log of 1 half. You can think of the natural log of 1 half as the natural log of 2 to the negative 1, right? That's what 1 half is. And then we know that when we have natural log of something to a power, it's negative 1 natural log of 2. That's where this comes from. And then the last step, of course, is to divide both sides by 1590, and we get k. So there's k. Now, if you left this as natural log of 1 half, this just wouldn't be a negative. But natural log of 1 half is going to be a negative number, and that's where the negative is going to come from eventually. This just reminds you that k is negative, which means we're now dealing with a decay rather than a growth. OK, if we plug all this in. Right, this is my k, multiply it by t. You basically have negative natural log of 2 times t over 1590, which is what this is, written as a space saver. Well, if we have e raised to that stuff, we have e raised to the natural log of 2 times t all over 1590, which is really e to the natural log of 2 times negative t over 1590. Right? All I did was just algebraically move these things around. But if we have something raised to a power times something, right? remember our rule x to the n times m is the same thing as x to the n to the power of m, right? Remember a power to a power, you multiply those. So this is really e to the natural log of 2 all raised to the power of negative t over 1590. And then e to the natural log of 2 just becomes 2. And that's where they get this piece, right? This is just going to be 2 raised to the negative t over 1590. Ta-da! That's just some simple algebra. So you can write it two ways. I like leaving it as e, but a lot of people rewrite it as 2 because we're you know, always dealing with these things in terms of half-lives. All right, we can now calculate the mass after 1,000 years by simply plugging in 1,000 into our formula, and we get 65 milligrams. And then we can also figure out how long it's going to take for the mass to go down to 30 by plugging in 30 for the answer and solving for t. And just like we solved for k before using natural logs, we're going to do a similar um, thing here. All right, we plug in the 1590 is there, right? natural log of 2. This is all just our normal function. 100, that's our initial amount. We plug in 30 for the answer, and we're going to solve for that t. Well, divide both sides by 100 is the first thing, because you want to isolate that e, so you can now take a natural log of both sides. Now you can take that natural log of both sides. And that's where you get natural log of e to this stuff is just that negative natural log of 2 right over 1590. This is all a constant times t equals natural log of 0.3. Solving for t means multiplying both sides by the negative 1590 and then dividing both sides by the natural log of 2. And when you plug that all into a calculator, you get 2762, or a long, long time. As a check, we can also graph this. We can graph our function. We can graph the line um, y equals uh, 30. 
right? And we can see where those intersect, and they intersect at roughly 2800. And remember, our answer was 2762. So there we have, we know that we didn't at least have a large mistake. Okay, the next uh, example of something that is an exponential growth and decay kind of thing is Newton's law of cooling. These types of problems give students the biggest uh, headache. They have the most trouble with these because really it's just a transformation of an exponential function, but it's hard for students to see that. They don't see it as a transformation. So Newton's law of cooling tells us that the rate of cooling of an object is proportional to the temperature difference. Remember, it's not temperature or something. It's the difference in the temperature between the object and its surroundings, provided that this difference is not too large. And this also um, applies to warming. So it's always Newton's law of cooling is what it's called, but it also applies if you put a cold object in a warm environment, it will heat up. OK, if we let t of t, this is the first bit of confusion for students because it's like two t's. Well, t just means it's a t function. It's a function that spits out temperatures. That's why we call it a t function. So the output is going to be temperature. The input is going to be little t, which is time. So t of t is just the temperature of the object at some time t. And then t sub s is the constant temperature of the surroundings the object is placed in. Okay, and with that, k ends up being a constant, and we get the rate of change of the temperature of our object is equal, right? It's proportional, it's equal to some constant k times the difference in the temperatures. Right? This is just a change in temperature. This is the temperature of the object minus the temperature of the surroundings. Okay? So this is just the difference in the two temperatures. Well, that equation doesn't quite seem like the equation we're used to. It doesn't seem to fit this, you know, k times y thing. But we can make it look more like this with a very simple variable change. We can now have a new function, y of t, that's going to be equal to the temperature function minus the surroundings. So this, this original temperature function, remember, gave us the actual temperature of the object. This function is just going to give us the difference in those temperatures, because it's the temperature of the object minus this constant temperature of the surroundings. So this y function is just giving us the difference in those two temperatures. How much more is our object from the surroundings, or how much less, right, if it's a hotter surroundings than the surroundings. OK, because this t of s is a constant, we can now see that if we take the derivative of these two sides, right? Take the derivative of each side of the function with respect to t, we just get y prime of t equals t prime of t minus 0, and it goes away. We get derivative equal derivative, right? And therefore, we get dy dt equals some constant times y. The change in the change of temperature is equal to some constant times the temperature change. So we can use our generic uh, function, our generic equation from 2, to transform this Newton's law of cooling function down here, which seems rather confusing, into the thing that we uh, kind of recognize, that it's just this normal ratio. And with that said, all we have to do is calculate those differences. So now they tell us that we have a bottle of soda that's at room temperature, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to put it in a refrigerator that's kept at a cooling temperature of 44 degrees. After half of an hour, the soda's now cooled down to 61 degrees. We're wondering what is going to be the temperature of the soda after another hour from that. And then how long is it going to take for the soda to cool down to 50 degrees? So let's start from the beginning. Capital T of T is going to be the temperature of the soda after T minutes. And we know, according to um, Newton's law of cooling, the change in the temperature of the soda is equal to some constant times its temperature minus the temperature of the surroundings. And the temperature of the surroundings is 44 degrees. That's where this first piece comes from. 
if we let y, our y function, be this difference in temperature, this temperature of the object minus the 44, then we know y sub 0. So the starting point, when t equals 0, what's the initial difference? Well, the initial temperature of the soda was 72, the temperature of the surroundings, which is constant, is 44, and that initial difference is 28, right? That's the initial difference in the temperatures. And we have that dy dt is equal to ky with the initial difference being 28. So we're now looking at a uh, the relative change in the differences. We're not looking at the change in the temperature, we're looking at the change in the differences. We can plug all that information into our generic formula, right, of yt equals y sub 0 e to the kt. The first thing we know is the initial is 28. So we've got one piece of the puzzle so far. Then we move on to the next piece. We're also told that when t equals 30, the temperature of the soda is 61. So when t equals 30 in the difference formula, we have temperature of the soda 61 minus 44. The difference in the temperatures is now 17. So remember, I'm trying to remind you guys here that 44 is the surrounding temperature. So 61 minus 44 is the change in that temperature. And we now have this secondary piece of the puzzle that our, our change in temperature function, right, our y function, had an initial change in temperature of 28. But when the time equals 30, the change in temperature was 17. Right? The difference in the two temperatures. The, the soda was 17 degrees warmer than its surroundings whereas it started off being 28 degrees warmer than its surroundings. Now that we have eliminated all of the unknowns except for k, we can solve for it. Divide both sides by 28. Take the natural log of both sides. right? And when you take the natural log of both sides, you get 30k equals natural log of 17 over 28. And then, of course, you divide both sides by 30. And there's your k. Again, best to leave it like that rather than having a decimal approximation, but the decimal approximation does give you a, an idea of how fast the relative you know, change is. And in this case, it's 1.6%. Okay, plugging all that back into our standard equation, we now have our standard y equation. And remember, this is an equation that represents the change in temperature. But if we want to solve back to the t, and just know what temperature um, is the actual soda at, well, that's just how fast it's changing plus the difference, right? Because this function tells you how fast the difference in the temperature is. Well, if we started off with a difference of 44 degrees, and then this is how much that difference is changing, then when we look at those two numbers, we'll end up getting the actual new temperature of the soda. So to figure out how warm it is after an hour, we go with the, uh, un the surrounding temperature of 44, the how much it's changing thing, right? And this ends up being a number that when you add it to 44, gives you 54.3. And you see that after an hour, the soda pop has cooled to 54 degrees temperature. The last thing, if we want to figure out how long it's going to take to get to 50, again, we've got the surrounding, right, plus the change in the difference of the two temperatures. We set that equal to 50. So we're basically asking, when is this thing going to be 6? And that's where this comes from. Right, if you subtract 44 from both sides, you get 28e to the negative. You know, I'm just going to put negative kt or just kt. I don't want to write this big thing. But you get the idea is equal to 6. When is this difference in temperature going to be 6? I.e., when is it going to be just 6 degrees uh, warmer than its surroundings? tells you that it's now 50. Right? If we stayed with our original equation, we would have been figuring out um, the difference in temperature. But when we slap on that plus 44, we know that difference plus the environment of 44 tells you how warm it actually is. Okay, to solve for the t, just like before, 
you divide by 28, then you take the natural log of both sides, plug that into a calculator, and it's going to take roughly 93 minutes or another hour and 33 minutes it will be 50 degrees. And that's Newton's law of cooling. Now you notice that if you take this temperature function and let t go to infinity, well when t goes to infinity you get a negative huge number with e to a negative huge number is the same thing as 1 over e to a huge number and this goes to 0 and you get 44 which makes sense. You take a warm soda, you plug it uh, into a refrigerator that's 44 degrees, it's going to get colder and colder and colder and colder and colder till it reaches 44 and then that's it. It's not going to get any colder. Alright, our last example We'll get away from Newton for a while and we'll look at a simpler example, money. We all understand how money works. We know that if we invest $1,000 at 6% interest, if we compound that annually, then after excuse me, one year, you just get 1,000 times 1.06, because that's 106%, right? It's the 100 just keeps your $1,000 and that extra 6% gives you the, the interest. 1060 bucks. After two years, you do that again, 106 times 106, you get that much money. And then after t years, it's going to be worth 106 raised to the power of t. But that is kind of not what normally happens in the real world. But we can generalize it and say that if an amount A, our initial amount A sub 0, is invested at some arbitrary interest rate R, then after t years, it's going to be A sub 0 times 1 plus R raised to the power of t. But like I said, interest normally isn't compounded once per year. It's normally compounded um, at intervals, n times per year, daily, monthly, um, quarterly, hourly, things like that. So if that's the case, this function very easily just becomes, instead of adding um, all of the interest every time, you add a piece of it. If you're going to compound it four times and you add one-fourth of it each time, and so instead of 1 plus r, you get 1 plus r over n, and then instead of just raising it to t, you're raising it to the nt because you do four times each year and then times the year, so that's why it's n times t. And if we try this with the same 6% and 1,000, we can see how the amounts change a little bit when we go from annual to semi-annual. It doesn't change much, but it changes a little bit. And then if we go to quarterly and monthly, also it doesn't change much, but it changes a bit. And then finally we can go to daily, and still not changing a lot, but it does change. What happens if we let that n, that number of compounds, go to infinity? Then we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of that formula. And, it, and we can pull the constant out, right? pull the a sub 0 out, and then we'll realize that, hey, wait a minute, um, that is the formula for e. And that's how we end up getting that when we have continuous compounding, a of t equals a sub 0 e to the rt. And that's our compound uh, interest formula. If we differentiate that formula, we get the derivative of a equals r, remember the, when we take the derivative of e to the rt, just the r comes down, we have r a sub 0 e to the rt, well that, this whole piece, this, this whole piece here is just the initial, right, that's equal to that, so by substitution we can see that the change in a with respect to time is just r times a t, i.e. that's r k times y, that's r, um, relative rate that we've been dealing with. So we can see that this is another example of it. If we go back to this example and see what happens when we do continuous compound interest, we can see that the number is again bigger, not by much, right? Um, but it is bigger. So in general, all exponential growth and decay f uh, formulas, all anything that's modeled by exponential growth and decay is going to be a variation of this formula. In the case of money, they normally call these A's, right? In the case of populations, they call them P's. In the case of uh, uh, radioactive growth, or sorry, radioactive decay, they normally call them M's for mass, but it's all the same darn thing. So every specific formula you're going to come across is really just some application of this general formula, and that's what you need to learn for exponential growth and decay.